Welcome to Tough Talk. I'm your host, Paul Terrace, and today my guest is Mike McCready. He really needs no introduction. He was the former mayor of Bloomfield Hills and has been the state representative for the 40th House District for the, uh, uh, since 2013. He is currently running for state senate for the 12th district. Welcome, Mike. Yeah, thank you, Paul. So, as a state representative, approximately how many bills do you vote on every year? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think in my first term, we voted on and passed into law about 350 some. And then our second term, we had a little bit less than that. And this term, I, I have to check the count. Um, you know, we, we do pass bills out of the House that may not make it through the Senate, and then there's always a handful that get vetoed as well. I couldn't give you the exact count, but we read probably at least over a thousand bills that are introduced, and whether they make it to the House floor, um, m many don't. You know, I shouldn't say many, but there's some that don't. But those that do, we probably look at about a thousand bills every term. and. Um, Keeps you busy, keeps you reading. That's quite it's a in, few. Yeah, it's interesting. Some of the uh, legislation that's proposed, it's always interesting. Recently, you voted against a bill which would prohibit schools from mm -hmm. banning the use of sunscreen by mm -hmm. students at school or school events. Mm -hmm. uh, you voted against this, and I think you were the only representative in the House I did. who did. <laughs> I did, yes. Um, why did uh -huh. you vote against it? Well, I, if I recall on that bill, I know they were trying to meet up to some like federal regulations, but I, when I met with the school superintendents of Oakland County, uh, I met with them about a week or two before that, and we get together with our school superintendents about once a month and go through legislation. They opposed it because, or they weren't in favor of it. They didn't want any more regulations that they needed to follow. And if the students needed sunscreen, none of the, the schools that we met with were opposed to the students bringing in their own sunscreen and applying it. Apparently there was maybe one school in the state of Michigan that um, did not allow their student to bring it in and uh, put it on themselves. So that's why they started doing this bill. And I, I just felt since our superintendents in Oakland County allowed students already to bring it in and apply it, there's no reason to even move forward with it in, in my mind, but it passed unanimously through the House, and I'm not sure where it stands in the Senate. Did you happen to look where it is in the Senate now? I, I did not, okay. but it just kind of boggled my mind mm -hmm. why this this type of law would have to even go to the state level. I mean, right. why not let it just remain at the school level? Exactly, and I think that's what the superintendents were saying, is you know we don't need any more regulations, and if you want to apply sunscreen, you know, for whatever SPA, SPA factor or SPF factor you need, you know, have at it. And some people are very sensitive to the sun and they need to apply it every day at a certain level. And they may come to school prepared for that and bring extra for them. And just it's leave it in the responsibility of each family or student. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, also, you voted, actually you went against Republican leadership and voted against the repeal of driver responsibility fees. Why, why did you do that? Okay, on those dri there were some that I voted for. I think there was a, there was a series of them. But the, the forgiveness of the previous debts, people were owed us money and weren't paying on their debt. That's the bill I voted. I voted for the other bills. I think there was a series of 10 or 11 bills. The one I voted on for that people needed to at least pay up to the, what they currently owe today. Uh, and versus um, forgiving that because other people who had to pay those bills had paid them and were up to date. Mm -hmm. It isn't fair in my mind that if you were, if you were delinquent in your payments that we should uh, relieve you of that responsibility. Okay. Um, what, what are a couple bills that you are proud of helping get passed? Well, I think at the end of last term, we passed a House bill that turned into, I believe it's uh, Public Act 319 which allows the schools to run a millage to, in, to expand the use of sinking funds. And you're an accountant, sinking funds an accounting term. You can do a millage for a school for, for a bond, you know, where you're gonna go ahead and rebuild something. It's usually a capital improvement, right? No operational money, all capital improvements. Or a sinking fund, a sinking fund is pay as you go. So we're gonna go fix our school and this is what, how we're, what we're gonna fix over a period of time. 
Well, mine had to do with the expanded use of singing funds for uh, school security and technology. And I worked on the bill for about four, oh, for four years. It was, took us two terms. We, we got it passed in the final hours of lame duck uh, in 2016. And um, it allows now schools to um, go and look at their school security and their technology and make improvements to, to offer more security uh, for the students, the administrative, and, uh, and, and the staff of the schools. So, for instance, uh, if, if you want double steel doors with a buzzer system and a monitoring, you know, a TV monitor to see who's coming and going, it would pay for that type of thing. If you needed to um, upgrade your um, cables in your school, and um, go to a more modern program, because many of the schools that we have are what were built in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And so you needed to maybe rewire a school system f to carry larger volume of information. You can do that. If you wanted to do, put in cameras around your school to monitor the grounds inside and outside, you can go to pay for things like that, which could be in real time with the local police department. So that was probably one of my, uh, especially with the time we're having now with the with, uh, guns in schools and the violence we've had with these, you know, just absolutely crazy um, situations occur. This is a bill that going forward, the schools now have a tool in place that they can exercise to and put in place better security for the students and the staff. Okay. Um. You, you helped pass Senate Bill 242, otherwise mm -hmm. known as the Good Jobs Bill. Mm -hmm. um, isn't that kind of uh, crony capitalism? That one, we put a 30, I think it was a 30 month uh, sunset on it. So it started, it was signed back in July of 2017, and now we're, what, in April of 2018. So we have about, uh, what would that put us at, maybe about 20, months to go approximately and it was to bring in um, lo uh, opportunities for l employers for large amounts of employees like 250 500 or above which would allow them to capture some of the income tax from people that they hire but they had to match and increase the level of pay by I think it was 125 percent and so uh, our county executive, L. Brooks Patterson, really wanted to see this bill. We, they felt they were hitting singles with bringing in large, with businesses into the Oakland County and Michigan area, but we weren't able to attract large opportunities. And I think if you remember uh, back at, towards the end of the summer, the state was working on with, I think, the MEDC and the business leaders of Michigan, an op opportunity to bring in a company called Foxconn, I think is what it was. They were the, they were the uh, Asian maker of of screens for your iPhones. Mm -hmm. And th there was an opportunity to bring a large volume of, of a plant to Michigan. And we needed to compete with other states like Wisconsin, Indiana, and there was a few others. And this gave them the opportunity to attract that kind of business, but also not just Foxconn, but they could attract a company like with General Motors that wanted to expand and we wanted to keep them here in Michigan. And there was there were certain uh, limitations and requirements on it. And I've not been a big fan of these types of tax breaks, but this one was really not geared towards any one particular type of individual or project. It was really much more broad based. And it, since it had a sunset on it of uh, 30 months, I think it was, I felt I could I could work with that and give give our state an opportunity to recruit some large businesses. And if you'd ask me today, has it been successful? Um, I, I don't think we've lured any large businesses here yet, but I know they're still working on it. So we'll have, have to evaluate it, you know, as we get closer to the end of the 30 month period. Okay. Um, you also voted against House Bill 5013, mm -hmm. which would reform Michigan's no-fault auto insurance. Can you explain why? Yeah, are we gonna go through all my no votes, Paul? <laughs> That's <laughs> no. fine. That's fine, yes, I did. Um, that bill, there was some savings in there that would add it up to about $300 over a, a three-year period. So $100 a year is what they figured. So if you had a car, if you have car insurance and let's say you were paying uh, $1,500 a year, it would save you $100 for three years, but there was no guarantee after that you'd, there'd be any savings. And you were giving up much of the benefits that we enjoy today 
in our no-fault auto insurance. And it's a, it's a very um, electric topic of conversation in Lansing. Uh, we've really pitted the insurance companies against the um, hospitals, the Brain Injury Institute, and the um, uh, CPAN, which is your attended care folks. And um, we've come to the table on trying to negotiate but it just appears from my perspective that unless the bills are biased towards the insurance companies, we can't seem to get anything passed. And you know, we keep saying quit trying to then redo the whole uh, no fault. Let's just try and hit some singles here you know, and, and just try and make some headway to chip away. Like let's do a, a fraud authority. Fraud is one of, one of the key, key um, arguments we keep hearing about in Lansing. And so let's set up a fraud authority that has a balance to it that not only helps the insurance companies, but helps, what, that, but helps the hospitals the, um, and the, the, um, the people that are being taken advantage of, which we're really the trial lawyers uh, getting in um, connection with the doctors, starting these clinics, but also going, sending runners out to try and find you know, people that have been in an accident to lure them in to try and get some type of settlement. Get the fraud, let's try and weed the fraud out, which will help reduce the cost. Um, there's also that seven day insurance policy you've heard me talk about. Right. A company called LA Insurance sells a lot of seven day insurance. And we need to look at that because what happens is, and the Secretary of State has the numbers on it, when they sell those policies, people cancel after uh, 24 hours. And they have, I think it's over 80%. Um, if, I, if I remember, I haven't read it in quite a while, so I might be off a little bit, but they just do it so they, people can get their plate and tab and their registration and they can drive away in their car. And we allow this to happen. And I sat down with the Secretary of State's office and the Michigan Auto Dealers Association and looked at the problem as they, through their eyes, we crafted three bills to address this issue and I've, my bills have been sitting waiting for a committee hearing now for three years. And I feel that um, we deserve a hearing, we should have a hearing. This is another problem that we need to address and just have a discussion about it. And maybe if some people tell me, no, it isn't a problem because here's why it works. Well, that's fine, well, let's have the discussion. And um, there's also a lot of other bills out there, some that have to do with the MCCA, the Michigan Catastrophic Care Association, which you've heard me talk about. That, that's a fund that the drivers of Michigan have, have put aside every year when you buy your policy, it's uh, one of the line items on your declaration page that right now just announced they're gonna increase it to $190 per vehicle annually. And that goes to care for people that you know, are severely injured in a automobile accident. You, know, you go through a certain amount at the hospital amount of money and then you, after you spent your first 534,000, you go into the MCCA. Well, they, we have $22 billion set aside in the MCCA of money that people, drivers of Michigan, have put into this fund. Yet, it keeps growing in, uh, in the investment because the, um, the insurance companies that are in charge of it have testified that they invested against the S&P 500. And if you follow the S&P 500, that has gone up annually on an average of 8%. This fund continually grows. Now that it's $22 billion, at some point, isn't this become an annuity of some sort that we don't have to be paying this much, but yet the fund is not foyable. We can't understand how they do their, um, their forecasting on that fund. We, we don't understand all the chargebacks that are in that fund, the fees that are associated with them. With them. Um, but but the, the big issue is their, um, we, we, I forget the term now, I'll think of it, when you do your future forecasting, um, and uh, they don't share that information with anybody. Would that be the actuarial yes, thank projections? You. Yeah, the actuarial projections. They don't share that, and we need to know those things. We need to better understand that fund. Uh, the insurance companies will probably tell you that money belongs to them, but that, to me that money belongs to the drivers of Michigan. And we should be able to understand, in a, and this is a day of transparency. If you look at many of the house, house bills that we passed out, it has everything to do with transparency. We need to be able to FOIA this fund and learn more about it because that is a tremendous investment um, that the drivers of Michigan have made. And if they keep in raising that fee, that $190 fee, they have to, should be able to explain that fully so we have a better understanding of it. And we haven't been able to get any of these bills uh, a hearing, which is unfortunate. We, we, we should have a hearing on them. We should vent these things and have discussions on them. Okay. Go, going back to these short-term uh, auto insurance policies. Yeah, seven-day insurance. Right. Mm -hmm. um, 
what would be your solution? Because wouldn't you be able to buy a you know six month or a year policy mm -hmm. and then seven days later cancel mm -hmm. it and mm -hmm. get a refund? Right, and and what we talked about in our policy is paying 100% up front the MCCA and the PIP, the personal injury protection portion of it and then you don't get that back. Uh -huh. You have to pay into those funds because those are funds that we all are collectively enjoying together for care, whether it's in the hospital, which is your personal injury protection, or after the hospital and you need long-term care of the MCCA. But as, as you heard me talk before, in the Birmingham Bloomfield area, you know we have a lower PIP cost. Um, if you have good credit rating, you've always paid your bill, um, you don't have many claims, that your personal injury protection is lower. Um, if you live in Detroit, you could be paying 10 times the amount of what we're paying um, because of uh, they relate it to the fraud, the crime that goes on in the, in the inner cities. But um, that's why their costs in Detroit and Dearborn are so high in some of these other inner cities that you hear them complain about, well, I can't afford a car, my car insurance is $3,500 a year, or it's $5,000 a year, and I drive a five-year-old whatever. Well, they're right, and but here's the problem. But if we get these people who are buying the 70 insurance to pay 100% into the PIP and the MCCA, then that collectively we're, we're still getting money from people that normally aren't paying in but still driving their vehicles. It's estimated that over 20% of the drivers in Michigan do not carry car insurance or inadequate, inadequate insurance. And the same in Detroit, it's estimated over 50% of the drivers aren't carrying car insurance. And, it, a lot, and many people point the finger at the seven-day insurance. Whether it's a right argument or wrong argument, until we vent this in a committee and on the House floor, who really knows where the truth lies? Mm -hmm. Okay. So why are you running for a state senate? Well, um, some of these issues that we just discussed, I still want to get accomplished with the auto no fault. I think we really need to reduce our rates. We need to have more transparency with the insurance companies and um, we need to work collectively together. And I know we can do it um, and we just have to keep hitting singles and stop going after a big master plan. And, and I think the drivers of Michigan, ex uh, Michigan expect that. And that, that to me is, a, is worth um, uh, uh, staying in the legislature and seeing this through. But also the other big issue, and I've been a big uh, hard champion, is fixing our roads. Our roads are in, ter are in terrible shape. We've underinvested invested in them over the years. The erosion factor is, mo is, much fa is much faster than the investment we're making. Now back in 2015, we passed s house bills um, that increased gas tax, registration fees, uh, diesel tax, um, and, and there was a couple others that we m did parity with because they were a kind of out of whack where, with the other tax program. All that money was, col it was being collected to help more, put more road funding in. But what we did is we matched it with general fund dollars. So uh, we were gonna raise 600 million through the new tax program and then match 600 million through the general fund. We have to see this through. We are now in, going into year two of the tax increase with the matching funds. We have to make sure we match those funds so that money then is transferred into fixing our roads. And I think it peaks at 2021, but also at the same time, uh, we put in a income tax cut with those bills. And the income tax cut is probably one of the only bill that might, or it's a PA, public act now, that might be the only one in the country where our income tax could actually start to decrease as our general fund rises and as inflation may stay in check, we would start dropping by a tenth of a point our income tax. And we could actually take it down to zero based on general fund growth. I wanna see those, those public acts make sure that we have the opportunity for the investment in our roads, the general fund dollars meet the tax revenue that's brought in, and that, that that tax bill that we passed into law is also exercised so that if our growth in the general fund continues to go up and we keep inflation in check, we literally will watch our personal income tax drop in Michigan and it could go all the way to zero. Okay, speaking of roads, I know now you uh, require a five-year warranty. Mm -hmm. but. Is that really long enough? 
Shouldn't we be demanding like a 10-year warranty or something? Um, I forget exactly the wording on the warranty issue, but we did stronger language on the warranty and taking more responsibility on it. You know, of all the thousands of miles of roads we have, there, I don't think we have a lot that we have to go back to in the scheme of things. I mean, it's a single digit percentage. If I might, I might be mistaken. I, I haven't looked at this in some time, but um, we do get into some issues, but the contractors that we're working with are getting better and better and they're doing design build now. So as they go like the Square Lake and Woodward, um, I-75 exit entrance, did you see those? That was a design build so they did it as they went and it really came out nice adding the lane the only hard part we had there is they did all that clear cutting of the trees and we lost a lot of nature sound deadening, deadening um, ability we've had a lot of complaints from the neighborhoods about the, the sound now now MDOT is going to go back and do some replanting but those were mature trees and I don't know how many acres they cut but it was, it was significant so there is some drawbacks uh, you know when you do these but the on-ramp on and the, um, the exit, the entrance is much better now. But warranties, um, you have to work with the contractor and many you, you can work with. Um, and there's only maybe a few, it really, you really get down to uh, a small percentage, Paul, on those, but they're getting better. The, the topic, I think the topic becomes, do you completely tear up a road and rebuild it from the ground up or do you scrape it and then put paving on top, which is more like the bandage approach. But some people believe that's a good way to go. Others believe we need to rip up these roads to fix drainage. At the end of the day, Paul, we haven't had the money to invest properly in our roads. And I wanna make sure that we are investing more money into our roads now through our existing revenue sources, which is like Act 51 we talk about, which was developed back in 1951. That's based on road miles. And unfortunately that, that um, mechanism hasn't worked well for Oakland County or some of our other surrounding larger counties because as our populations have grown our roads aren't getting any longer we're just getting more lanes and the act doesn't take that into account okay um, let's talk about Detroit um, how much has Detroit cost Michigan taxpayers between the city t bankruptcy and the bailout of Detroit public schools? Um, on the city bankruptcy, I think our settlement on that was $185 million. And, but we had those foundations that came in and helped out and the DIA even put in money. So I forget what the total number was on that. But our state obligation, I think was about $185 million in that portion. And then the um, Detroit Public Schools, I don't recall exactly what that number is, but remember we're under about a 10-year emergency manager um, rule. Right. And then they, they, took the, they, took the, they took the school, I think, into bankruptcy and then started a new system, started a new school system. And so I'd have to get back to you on the exact number, but yeah, it was, uh, those are some significant dollars, but you have to look at the per reason why, you know, mismanagement is some of it, but also declining population, uh, low tax dollars, un unable to collect tax dollars, and um, the pension funds that the state is obligated to pay was part of it. And I sat, probably one of the um, most memorable um, committees and times I spent in the legislature was serving on that Detroit Bankruptcy Committee. I think that was back in 2014. And um, Earl Pileski, who now is the chair of MISHTA, was uh, chair of the committee. We were all appointed by the speaker. There was five of us. And we sat and listened to hours and hours of testimony from the mayor, the city council, the DIA, and, but members of the, of the pension fund that was um, going upside down, you know, the, the general worker, and the police and fire that had put money aside for years that were staring at maybe not getting those pensions. It was really an eye-opening experience. And to be able to work with the federal judges on that um, was really a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. It was, it was a great education for me. Okay. 
Over the weekend, I watched Detroit Superintendent of Schools mm -hmm. and the head of the Detroit School Board yep. point their fingers at Lansing and mm -hmm. the governor mm -hmm. as to why the test scores are so poor, right. pointing to the emergency manager. Right. Um, how would you respond to, to them? Well, um, we can always look back and point fingers at who's responsible for what. But right now, the, the superintendent and the school board, and I've listened to the, Dr. Vitti, and um, I think he's a very bright guy. And I feel like there's some real good opportunity now for that school system to move forward. So instead of looking back and pointing fingers and looking back at those test scores that we just saw announced that are terrible, he has a plan in place with the school board that appears to be extremely engaged and uh, really working to fix the problem. And we need to support this and, and give them the opportunity. He does have a track record from where, I think he, where did he come from, Jackson, um, Florida? I think it was down, I think it was the south, I, I forget. But he, yeah, he has, sure. a, from what I understand, he's got a very good track record. We need to give him an opportunity and to turn the school system around and put it on the right uh, foot. And I, I, listening to him, he's very strong, he's very knowledgeable, he's um, well-intentioned. The school board is working, uh, I think, it appears collectively together. So I can't, I'm not gonna point fingers back. We need to look forward and support him and that school board and those students to make them successful. Okay, um, but do you think that was fair of them to be cr critical of the emergency manager? You know, um, I, don't, I think the emergency manager in some in, in situations has worked out really well, and we can point to areas where it's worked out well, and maybe in other areas that hasn't worked out well. But, uh, you, you know, when you're in public life, someone's always pointing back at something, and I think that's fine. It's a good history lesson, but we have to look forward on what we're working towards and what we need to achieve, and especially educating our children. It's the most important thing that we have to invest in and support, pay attention to. And, um, you know, the, we've had many different bills come since I've been in the legislature on schools and, and testing. And um, at some point, we have to put some of these bills aside and let a system that's been put in place mature and have an opportunity to um, demonstrate its ability and not continually be challenged. But it do won't, doesn't seem to happen that way. So, oh. so if it, is it fair? I can't comment. It's just part of the public life that we live in. Okay. Yeah. Um, Shri Tanadar, a candidate for governor, yeah. uh, Democrat. Not Rick Snyder. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah. Um, he wants to put an end to profit charter schools. Mm -hmm. um, what are your thoughts on profit charter schools? You know, charter schools are um, a competition for, pu are for public schools. And in, in some areas, I think they've been uh, very beneficial. And I don't think there's anything wrong with, with uh, competition. Uh, I'm a big public school supporter. I came through the public schools. We have great public schools in the Birmingham, Bloomfield area, the Senate district I'm running in. You know, you look at Clarkston, Orion Township, all you know, these are great public schools. Um, and so um, charter schools, whether they're privately owned or publicly owned, if they're doing the job, they're educating the student, and they're, and they're showing a success rate, I don't know if we should argue against how they're owned as much as we need to measure their success. And if they're successful, we su should support them. And um, that's the way the system was put in place back in the 90s when Engler was governor. And I, I don't, I, I can't say if it's private or public, but we need to measure a school on its success. And, and if it's successful, support it. And if it's a, if it's a school that's not successful, the children, the students aren't getting the education, or the test results that are so desired, then we have to look at what the problem is and, and um, fix it. Okay, well, we'll have to end it at that, but I want to thank okay. you for okay. coming yeah, on. Yeah, sure, and Paul. Thank you for having me. Best of luck right. in your race. Well, thank you.